right, so welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Joel Reed, the former CEO of IM Robotics and the current uh, director of the Pittsburgh Robotics Network. Joel, welcome to the pod. Thank you, Spencer. Good to be here. Appreciate it. Good to have you. So uh, typically, I like to start out by asking people kind of how they got into what they do and uh, down that trajectory. And um, yeah, so uh, I don't know. How did you get into uh, the robotics world and uh, you know, sort of what attracted you to it? What keeps you there today? No, that's a really good question. Um, could could be quite a few things to talk about there. Um, do, the direct answer for that to that is that I was working at Innovation Works in uh, well, I started there in two thousand two, but it was around two thousand five, two thousand six uh, that Scott Friedman and Hans Morvik of Sigrid uh, came through with an application. Interesting and. Um, I had worked very closely with that team on their business pitch um, and really connected with them and found that I had a strong affinity uh, for this, I guess at the time, you know, as a, as a business model and a solution and application area, it was still very, very early. And um, I've always enjoyed um, understanding and, um, you know, trying to position and pitch um, very innovative concepts. And what was more innovative at that time than fully autonomous systems moving things around in the warehouse? It still is innovative um, today. It, it, it's still very, very innovative today, right? Uh, I, you know, the right word is, is that we're still at the nascent stage uh, of the industry. It just so happens that the life cycle seems to be extended in the robotics field because, well, you know, it, it's hardware and hardware is hard. But, um, <laughs> Amen, brother. Yeah, so I, you know, you know that more than I do. So I, um, we, Innovation Works had funded them, and uh, I had kept up the relationship. And at the time, Innovation Works, their model was that you know their, you know, investment associates, um, if there was a good fit, it was a great platform for adding. You know, commercial talent or or other kinds of team, you know, uh, you know, business talent, you know, to those companies, and so it was almost encouraged, um, you know, that or at least or at least celebrated um, that uh, or supported that if uh, there was a match, um, that someone might slip out of Innovation Works and go join a company. That's cool, and that's exactly what I did. Nice. So oh, uh, awesome. you know, I'm a big fan of that, and and ultimately ended up coming back to them with another robotics company, All Point Systems. Uh, we received um, our first uh, funding, our first angel funding from Innovation Works, and even I am Robotics. Um, okay, so just to make sure I'm tracking. You started with Seagrid, then you went to. I'm sorry, I I, I apologize. It's not one that I'm intimately aware of. Uh, what did you say it was? Uh, so I was at Seagrid, and um, when I was there, uh, a person. Uh, so he's he's a part of the community. His name is Aaron Morris. You might know the name more than I the do company. know Aaron Morris. Uh, we've had many a cocktail together uh, at some business meetings with mutual clients. Yeah. So there you go. So he's now running All Vision, uh, but at the time he had a company called uh, All Point. Systems. Oh, cool. Okay, all point systems. Sorry. I mean, it's it's my job to know these things, but sometimes one slips through the cracks. So. Uh, that's your fine. patience there. Well, this is this is a good story. Um, when we were at Seagrid, um, Aaron was working part time uh, with Seagrid. Maybe it was full time. It doesn't matter. But he had he had come on board, and he was really he had taken the position. You know, he was a PhD uh, roboticist out of CMU. Worked under Red Whitaker. Cool. Um, but, and, and I always credited him, you know, this, I think this is why he's a very strong founder. Um, he, he wanted to embed with the sales team because he really wanted to see what it was like to be out in the marketplace Smart and guy. learn sales, learn marketing, you know, talk to customers. They don't so teach he in school. was assigned to, um, uh, join me on sales calls. And at that time as a startup. We were taking, uh, you know, the 1,400 pound uh, tugger and putting it on a 24, a 20 uh, foot straight truck and driving it, you know, five or six hours to client sites doing demonstrations. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a whole nother story. But 
I mean, that's um, a real so salesman. I, I, what's that? I said, that's a real salesman as far as I'm concerned. You would say salesperson now, but you know, I mean, yeah. doing those long road trips to get to a client site and demoing, I mean, that's as real as it gets. Yeah, well, it's uh, what do the salespeople say? It's the phrase, um, you know, pressing up, uh, pressing the, the glass, right? Pressing up against the windshield, and a lot, lot of windshield time. So <laughs> we uh, we spent hours uh, in the truck and getting to know each other, and uh, had a really good time. A lot of lot of good memories, That's awesome. Um, you know, successes and and uh, lessons learned. But um, you know, he, when when he started getting more serious about all point systems, he you know he and I were talking and. And had encouraged me to join uh, him and Seth Cutterba. I, I hope I didn't mess his name up. Sorry, Seth, if you listen to this. But um, <laughs> we, uh, it was just the two of them. And so I joined uh, All Point Systems and uh, got the first funding into that, wrote the business plan, found the first customer, and started positioning the company in the marketplace. And then at that point, I had um, uh, agreed with my wife to take a break from startups. Fair um, enough. The, you know, they are uh, very trying and challenging. Absolutely. And, it's uh, consuming. Went, yeah. 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 So I went to go work for uh, the PTC and then I ended Pittsburgh up. Pittsburgh Tech Council for our viewers. Tech Council, Pittsburgh Technology Council. Yep. Another good organization. Amen. And then I went to go work at C Level, which is a uh, strategic marketing uh, firm. And cool. uh, it was after those two that I started getting the itch again and I reconnected with Tom at uh, Tom Galuzzo at Innovation Works. I'm glad you said the itch, by the way, because I feel like it definitely is that, like the drive to uh, to be in a startup or, or just running a business in some capacity. It's, it's very much, I feel like addictive is a strong word, but it's a drive, right? And it consumes you and, and it drives a lot of people to do incredible things and others to ruin their lives and, and marriages. And so, I guess, where do you think that derives from in you, if I can ask that, uh, or if that's too personal, we can steer clear, obviously. No, that that's fine. Um, I, you know, Spencer, I don't know, uh, to be quite frank with you. I, um, you know, my my background is, is uh, I thought I was going to be a physician, is what my mom uh, wanted me to be, and she my dad was wanted me to be. See? Yeah. And, uh, and I actually uh, went to school. Uh, my undergrad was uh, biology. Pre-med? Uh, with a chem iron. Uh, well, I guess you could call it pre-med. Um, I started taking the MCATs and, you know, I, I wasn't doing as well as I would have liked in my studies and wasn't very motivated by uh, studying for the MCATs at that time. And I went through some introspection and realized that that's not who I was. That makes a lot um, of I, sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, I, uh, it, it wasn't in my nature to have somebody's life in my hands. <laughs> um, although I love having that level of responsibility and I think maybe that's why I, I veer towards leadership positions in companies. Yeah. Um, you still kind of do, right? It's just, you're not having them bleed out. You're having their livelihood. Right. And so it's, well, that's right. From a financial standpoint. Yeah. Right. That, and that's, 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 uh, you know, a, a great observation. Thank you. But, but, um, yeah, so, you know, and, uh, so I, I, I had to pivot. Uh, using an entrepreneurial term, and I ended up getting a dual degree MBA. It was in health administration and business administration, awesome. but I started pivoting pretty quickly and went into um, information technology at the time. And Very I took cool. some classes, management of, of information technology. I actually did uh -huh. uh, biz admin and computer science as an undergrad for similar reasons. Uh, when I was a kid, my dad was a surgeon, ortho, and he always said to me, um, Spencer, you like working with power tools, you should become a doctor. And my response was, uh, Dad, I like working with the power tools, but I don't really want to use them on people. And so I feel like uh, we're more similar than I realized in that way. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, so, yeah, and so I, um, I, I got into consulting right out of graduate school. That's awesome. And, and I think that really helped me uh, to become an entrepreneur because it was doing, it was more strategic planning and it was, um, you know, bringing efficiency to systems. Um, we were working on healthcare information technology, uh, so healthcare clinical records at the time. Those systems didn't exist in the healthcare system, you know, pre-2000. What, what decade would this have been, just to try and play? So we've done some HCIT work as well. It's a sweet market to be in. I really like it. Yeah, well, these, again, this was on the cutting early edge. This was early um, 2000s? 
It was early 2000s. So yeah. I remember so working I, in the 90s in my dad's office, still putting away paper charts. Like a big, you know, we would, um, you know, and I think I've told this story once before, but I'll mention it just for perspective. Um, you know, me and a, a childhood friend would basically get incentivized with candy bars and 20 cc syringes. We would fill up with water and use the super soakers to blast each other. And uh, we would seal up letters and we would put paper physical charts away. And the game was revolutionized, as you know, by electronic medical records and a lot of, you know, adjacent tools and diagnostic tools as well. And I mean, the early 2000s would have been uh, just for other people listening. That was the bleeding edge of that. That was when all that stuff was first coming to fruition. I mean, Epic is now one of the biggest companies in the world, as far as I know, and it's changed the game forever. So that's yeah. that's amazing that you were there for that. I, again, sorry to, to hog it for a second, but I just wanted to give that perspective on that. No, that's fine. A lot of those companies that you know created Epic and others, um, HBC, uh, HBC was an HBC or HBO company. Uh, it's not the the media giant. Um, you know, they were founded during that time frame, and wow. you know, you had you had large distributed database systems like Oracle and others that Giants. were driving a lot of that change. So I was there during Y2K. We did large projects. Um, that's where I learned project and product management. Um, that's where I learned, um, you know, uh, you know, efficiency uh, methodologies. And and my tagline that I use sometimes is that. Um, you know, I'm an entrepreneur stuck in a consultant's body. <laughs> like that a lot. I, I think that's true because I was, um, I started my career off as a consultant. I look like a consultant, right? So, I, you know, I'm not wearing a hoodie and or a black t-shirt, um, but yet I've always been an entrepreneur. Uh, so I can't change the way I look or who I am, um, but I've always enjoyed, uh, you know, and the other thing too, Spencer, is, is when I when I took my when I did got into my first entrepreneurial uh, effort, it was we I was out in San Francisco, yeah, and, and um, I went to go work for an online file storage company uh, called iDrive. Okay. Now the thing about that uh, first dot com revolution, it was heavily funded, in a lot of ways like it is today. And so as an employee of a well funded company, I was earning a almost a market rate salary. <laughs> um, so you know it, it, you weren't taking a ton of risk. Right. Yeah. And you were having a great time and you were pushing something new and trying to get people to, you know, change their processes or the way they conducted their business. And, um, you know, so for me, it wasn't a lot of risk. Now, I took a lot more risk later um, sure. in in some of those ventures, you know, that I had mentioned. But at that time, it, it wasn't very risky. And, and if you can get a company to Series A, you're very quickly paying those employees uh, close to market rate because you need to be competitive in a highly competitive uh, talent race. Yeah, and we've experienced that as well. I mean, it's definitely, I mean, as you know, SK works with mainly subcontractors and we typically pay above market for that reason because we're not securing a full-time position. Right. And so if you want the best talent, you got to pay them usually like one and a half what the full-time market's willing to bear at least to, to attract that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, it, it was, and this is another good story. So I, pr I appreciate the question. Um, I was uh, in year three working for what was then a uh, top five um, or the, the big five consulting firms. It was Ernst & Young at the time. Nice. And I was in San Francisco and I was uh, on a project in Oakland, California, and I was riding BART back and forth with a colleague. Uh, we both, <laughs> yeah, many memories we both of lived. BART. Yeah, yeah, BART, right? And um, at the time, I was talking to recruiters because, as I always say, if you're in one of those large consulting firms, you know, you either are signing up for the rest of your life or you've taken your education and uh, you're going to go apply it somewhere else. And, and quite frankly, in a lot of ways, that's the model, or at least yeah. it was. Back. Well, they definitely know that, too, right? PwC, Ernst & Young, I mean, all of those guys, Deloitte. I mean, your partner track or your partner track and then you move, I feel like, right? And so I think that's... I think expected. it's true. They invest a lot of money, but they also charge a lot for you and they squeeze a ton of hours out of you. So, you know, it's it's actually a pretty decent trade off. But, you know, I um, I confided in her that I was looking for something new and I kind of wanted to move on. And she um, she opened up and said, uh, well, uh, I'm actually leaving this week. <laughs> Just came and I said, where are you going? She goes, I'm going to work for this startup in uh, San Francisco uh, called iDrive. And I literally said to her, I'm like, take me. That's awesome. uh, and a week later, I had an offer from the company. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. So, so that, that, that was the dot-com age, right? Mm -hmm. And um, 
and a phenomenal experience. And that's really where, um, you know, I realized what my strengths were and what my, my likes were and uh, been on that track ever since. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, it's certainly a roller coaster. At least from personal experience, I would say the risks and the rewards are, are equally strong. Um, I'm glad you've stayed with it. I mean, clearly you're, you're an asset to the field. Um, yeah, so to, to kind of jump back in, um, I guess what brought you to your current position with the PRN? Um, you know, sort of why, why go from consulting more into to like a, I guess I don't know how to categorize the PRN. I would say it's, it's sort of a- Economic development. It's, you know, it's a, it's a trade association. That's a good way to put um, it. Yeah. Yep. Appreciate it. Uh, so when I was um, another another good story, uh, you have the time, right? Yeah. I've, I've, usually <laughs> we, we keep this video no, open kidding. ended. So. No, I'm totally kidding. Um, so when I was at sea level, um, and and forgive me, this one's kind of a medium length story here. They, um, my father, who was in the airline industry. Uh, was working with a business group out of Nashville that was Pretty doing sick. long range planning uh, for their airport, uh, which that community is growing, has been growing rapidly, and they were doing a major expansion of their airport. And he, um, they were, and, and this committee included representatives of the mayor's office, um, business leaders in the community, uh, the executives of the airport, um, and also uh, participants from one of the world's nations, if not the world's leading architectural firms. And the topic of the working group came up. And somebody, somebody in the uh, group said, you know, now hold on a second, we're, we're budgeting tens of millions of dollars, you know, for these parking garages that are supposed to last us 20, 30, 40 years. I'm reading a lot about autonomous self-driving vehicles. And how is that, how would that impact the design and the operation of a, you know, major capital project that's supposed to last, you know, 30 plus years. So my father, knowing that I had this past in robotics and knowing that Pittsburgh was a top community, you know, said, Hey, um, would we be able to put this business steering committee in touch with something in Pittsburgh? And, you know, I'll cut to the chase on this one. It was really difficult to do. But in that journey, I met people like Jackie Erickson um, and, uh, um, and uh, Courtney Ehrlichman of uh, Traffic, originally of Traffic 21, uh, now with, I think, Robotics. I believe so. And, and I started re-engaging with the robotics community. And through that journey, um, Jackie had, uh, I think, mentioned my name to Tom. Now, to Tom, uh, this this is kind of a long way to get to your your. When question you say Tom, you refer to Tom Lowers or a different Tom? Uh, Tom Galuzzo. Tom Galuzzo. My apologies. Yeah. So, and I also during that process met Kevin Dowling, um, Good guy. who's really the instrumental people of uh, of creating the PRN and and bringing it to this point in time. I like Kevin a lot. And uh, so, one, I had met all of these people. Uh, that were involved with the PRN, and I think you know, and it's it's worth mentioning to you know your listeners that you know Jackie and Kevin and Aaron Morris yeah. um, also, um, and Patty wrote and um, Patty's awesome uh, as well. You, she's fantastic, right? Volunteered for uh, the Girls of Steel for quite a while after grad school. Yeah, she's she's yeah. Good. she was always good to me. She's kind uh, of a low key good. badass, I feel like, because. She's one of those people that's very quiet, and then you start talking to her, you're like, this person is incredibly smart, <laughs> like way smarter yeah. than me, and is running a lot of stuff that, you know, she just don't realize she's doing, you know, and, and I don't know, I mean, low-key badass is, I think. And she's been the common thread through several organizations um, that even predated uh, the PRN. But in any event, I, you know, I kind of met all these people, and I've always had, um, you know, I have a, I have a I'm a, huge promoter of Pittsburgh. You know, I've been involved in two robotics companies, um, but I'm also on the commercial side. And um, so fast forward, I met Tom Galuzzo of IM Robotics and I ended up joining that team. And um, almost immediately, uh, I joined the board of the Pittsburgh Robotics Network. 
Kind of and subsequently, or sub at the same time, simultaneously with I am. Yeah, Got yeah, it. that's right. Okay, that's right. So um, while I was at I am, um, first uh, heading up sales and marketing, but then as I moved into the CEO position, and so um, so I was on the board, and you know somewhere around that time, uh, this is back in 2017, the Brookings uh, Institute uh, had published a report, and it's very well cited now and referenced. And it, it essentially concluded that, um, you know, there are these uh, industry clusters that Pittsburgh has some very strong assets in. Um, and they're great opportunities for us uh, to, to embrace um, and to um, actually accelerate our efforts in them and become bigger leaders uh, than, than we may currently have been. In robotics in particular, and I cite this quite a lot with the PRN, sure. we lead the nation in investment in robotics and AI research and development, but we actually lag the country in terms of commercial output. It's about a four That's times nice. gap. Wow. Um, by, by the indicators. And I remember uh, when that, those bookings guys came through town, I just, I guess that number was lost on me somehow. That's that's an incredible gap. I mean, so what you're saying so, is we, just, just to under, make sure I'm comprehending it, um, we output about a fourth of what we do in research in terms of commercialization. So the research spending is quadruple the the gross revenue in terms of what we're actually putting. Yeah, you have to look at the study. They, they so, use these quotients. So they have these formulas uh, for how they were doing apples to apples comparison, but it's the inputs of investment um, that goes into you know the R&D machine. And then the outputs uh, were um, factor, they factor things like uh, revenue, uh, jobs, um, basically commercial outputs. Okay. Um, it's not, it sounds like it's kind of sort of proprietary, the study it requires looking at, but it's still worth considering and it's, it's a valuable number. Take, take a look at the report. Yeah. You can I Google uh, Brookings Institute, um, Pittsburgh Economy, and uh, you should find it's a 2017 report. Sure. Um, and there's, there's a lot of things that have come from that since then. But around that time, I went to one of those uh, events that they had. And it, uh, I think it was one that was organized by the PRN. And there's about 50 to 60 people in the room. And Sean Luther was there uh, with the folks from the Brookings Institute. And, um, and you know, disclosure, uh, Sean Luther now runs Innovate PGH. It's, it's a great organization that is working to, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, take, take an in, build initiatives on top of uh, those findings. And, um, uh, and I actually sit on his board as well. But anyway, That's getting awesome. back to the point, getting back to the point is, is that uh, they were trying to go through the conclusions and I, and I decided to try to make a point to illustrate what they were talking about. And so I, I raised my hand to ask a question. And um, I did something that I rarely did. I said, do you mind if I actually pull the audience here? And there's like, fine, sure. And so I said, okay, everybody here, you know, just show of a show of hands, how many people here have direct responsibility for sales and marketing? Now there were about 50 or 60 people in the room. Two people raised their hands, two people <laughs> in that entire room. And I was one of them, right? I think I might've been the so, other one if I'm remembering correctly. What's that? I, I might've been the other one if I'm remembering correctly. But I could well, I can't one. remember if you're there. I remember Bob Rada. So maybe it was three uh, <laughs> that raised their hand, but you know, the point was, is that we have a very strong technical community. So I had already seen this opportunity, if you, you know, if we can put it that way. And while I was on the board, um, I would, you know, espouse my own ideas and suggestions. Um, and this is one of those lessons learned that if you continue to voice your opinion over and over again, people might just say, okay, why don't you solve it? Um, <laughs> so so uh, everybody's- um, so in any event, uh, when I became available uh, last year and I had some uh, time, uh, that's exactly what happened. I was talking to Kevin and Jorgen and Parag and others on the board meeting, and uh, and I decided to step in and do a review, an assessment, um, you know, conduct a, a strategic planning exercise, and I feel very passionate about this. And I'll, I'll add, Spencer, that I did work for the Technology Council, right? Mm -hmm. So I understood economic development. I worked for Innovation Works. I, I helped companies, I helped the community accelerate things. And I worked for this, this strategic and business consulting firm in C-Level. Um, so I, I, have, I had a very unique set of experiences where 
I know a broad range of uh, the leaders in the robotics community. I have strong relationships and contacts uh, in the foundation community because I've served on some nonprofit boards. Sure. Um, you know, I, I had gotten to know, you know, the Allegheny Conference and the Pittsburgh Regional Alliance and Catalyst Connection and, you know, you name, you know, all these great organizations. Yeah, and I'm a big fan of all of those, obviously. Yeah. You know, I mean, you and I share this passion. So there's, yeah. So it, 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 so far it's, it's worked out really well and, and uh, we came up with the plan and we're in the middle of executing it now. That's awesome. I, honestly, I'm really glad you did that because um, it's a community I also love and, and hold very dearly. And I mean, also, obviously, I like Nashville and the Bay Area. I know about the BART, which is their public transit system that you mentioned. And I mean, I, I travel and I go to all these places, but I always come back to Pittsburgh and uh, it's where I was born. I don't know if it's where I'll die, but there's a high probability of it. <laughs> and it's good to have someone like you at the helm of our robotics community because, I mean, it's it's a community that I hold very dear to my heart, and you're clearly competent at you know at bringing those people together, and it's something you know that I don't want to say we've needed for a while, but I want to say I'm glad that we have. And so yeah. Well, when I when I came back in 2002, um, do you know Astro Teller? Um, not personally. Uh, my dad financed a startup called Body Media that he was, I believe, the CEO of back in the day. Yep. Evo, I know personally, who is one of his yep. lieutenants now. Yep. So. Well, uh, I, I happened to get to know him just a little bit. And, you know, he, he shared with me that at the time he viewed Pittsburgh as a startup. With the, the, the whole city? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Sounds right? very you know, astro, we, to be honest. No, it, it, <laughs> it was, it was um, you know, very poignant because you know, you know, if you look at a startup, you, you've got some natural resource, whether it's intellectual capital or people um, or access to some kind of limited resource, and you have an idea of how to bring that in, you know, to a marketplace. Um, all of that existed in Pittsburgh. And there was this huge opportunity where, you know, cities not named San Francisco or New York um, were starting to emerge as areas of innovation. We already had the hard part solved, you know, with Carnegie Mellon being a leader, you know, an academic sure. uh, instructor. I, I completely and, agree. Yeah. But I'm and biased because so, I went there. So. What, what's that? So I'm obviously biased though, because I went there. I mean. Well, right. Well, and, and you know, and, and so it's, you know, it's, we've all been part of this startup. And, you know, we, Pittsburgh is, has emerged, not, not emerging, we, we've already emerged. And part of the PRN story, which, you know, I'm emphasizing very strongly is, is that we are one of the, if not the top robotics community in the world. And um, people who are closely tied to robotics worldwide know this, mostly because of CMU, right? Um, but it's a surprise to a lot of other people, including investors, which makes it a little bit harder to raise money when you're, you know, a founder looking for, for investment. Yeah, but that makes sense. believe it or not, a lot of people in Pittsburgh don't appreciate it. I believe it because I see it every day. You know, it's it's definitely apparent. I mean, we we go through a constant, you know, almost Sisyphusian effort of having to educate people about, you know, the the level of talent we have here locally in Pittsburgh. I mean, we sell to the Bay Area and to Massachusetts and to other parts of the world as well. And but I mean, those are markets people think of as robotics hubs, right? So that's why I'm mentioning those. And I mean, you have to bring up CMU, you have to mention, you know, the strong presence of the Pittsburgh Robotics Network, the PRN that we've been talking about. Um, you know, you mentioned companies like Seagrid that you worked for, you know, that are doing amazing stuff that, you know, was groundbreaking, I mean, and, and still is in, in many ways. And I mean, you're right, <laughs> people don't always realize it, but it's true, I mean, you know, we're well, doing- yeah, another, another inspiration what I'm doing is, is when I was help working with Tom Galuzzo and raising our Series A, I spent a lot of time in the Bay Area uh, to close that round. And I was at a networking event and I was giving, you know, your elevator pitch. And, you know, I would get a good response and there'd be some interest and, and invariably the next question would be, well, where are you located? And, you know, I would answer Pittsburgh and I'd get a little bit of a quizzical look. You know, <laughs> and I knew it was coming, so I, I, I immediately responded and said, well, you know, Carnegie Mellon is located oh, in Pittsburgh. Yeah. And then, and then there would be that, that, that association. They're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So 
I, I would sometimes joke afterwards that, you know, what we could do to help raise um, the awareness and, and make it easier to raise capital in Pittsburgh is rename the city Carnegie Mellon. <laughs> That's pretty hilarious, actually. Yeah, I've been to the Bay Area as well. A decent amount. I disagree amount. with that, but you know, but and so that's another thing that's driving the PRN. It's one of the big things that we're doing is is actually declaring ourselves the leader that we are, um, and going you know you know uh, going through uh, pursuing visibility initiatives and promotional initiatives so we can um, you know answer that question why Pittsburgh and I and I put it this way, Spencer is is that if a friend of yours um, got a job offer and took a job in Austin, anybody sure. across the country would say, that's amazing. That's a great place to be in tech, right? Yeah, clearly I mean, you're reading my bottle of whiskey here that says Texas on see? it. <laughs> yeah. See? So, you know, you would never question someone that was taking a job in tech in Austin, right? I know there might be some reasons, but but if, if, if somebody was around the country um, saying that I just got a job offer in Pittsburgh to work in robotics, um, they would have that same experience. Well, why Pittsburgh? Not if they're in the and, know, but a layperson for sure, I think, would, would have that. I, I, think it's, I think it's really just a couple of degrees of separation from in the know. It, I, I'm not talking about my mother or my grandmother, right? I mean, I'm really talking about, I, I, here I am talking to an investor um, who, who is, has an interest and an investment you know, profile in robotics, and they didn't necessarily know why we were located there. That's so, a problem. I would posit to you an anecdote as well, though. So I, I had some friends that had a startup. Uh, it's called Rorus. It, it didn't exist very long, but they raised about one and a half million, and then it just proved unviable. But um, anyway, so they uh, got an initial seed round from Alpha Lab Gear, which is an innovation work subsidiary for our viewers. Obviously, you know that. And um, they they got fifty grand there. Then they went to the Bay Area. They got five hundred grand, and then they did additional raises to get up to one and a half mil. And um, their investors in the Bay Area, I think, you know, they'd asked them initially, like, do you want us to move out here? Like, do you want us to get out of Pittsburgh, come to the Bay Area? And the response that the investors gave was, why? So you can spend all of our money faster? Like, no, stay in Pittsburgh. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. I mean, I, I think there's there's some understanding and leeway there as well. I mean, our real estate prices it's are angry. great. Our talent is reasonable. It's a great place to live. You know, I mean, it's. It's an awesome no, it, city. I really do love it. There's a reason I keep coming back here. Listen, I, I, I think founders can turn down investment if they're um, presented with that um, condition um, because I, I, there are enough investors now that are starting to flip over to the other side. And I absolutely agree with you. We're capital efficient um, in, in this area, not to mention, you know, we have, um, you know, some of the best and brightest, you know, of a pool of limited resources. Yeah. No, absolutely. That's uh, that's a good way to look at it. So I guess you sort of mentioned the education hurdle. I'm just trying to follow up on that. So I'm take a stab in the dark here, see if it lands. Um, where do you find you're coming up against the most resistance from? Is it the Bay Area? Is it Massachusetts? Somewhere in between New York? Like for you, I guess, where, where are you kind of hitting the hardest? You, know, you mentioned two degrees of separation from in the now. Uh, I, I think your question is, is why isn't that recognition there? Well, it was more where is it coming? You don't have to answer geographically. Maybe a why. I mean, I'm happy to pivot to that if you'd rather answer that. No, no, I, I, I don't necessarily understand um, your specific Where are you coming question. against resistance uh, when you try to pitch Pittsburgh as a viable tech resource? Um, like, I, you I, just, mean, I want to you understand mean invest, You mean investor communities? Correct. Yeah. Like, like, where is that uh, misconception kind of the most prevalent in your experience and where do we need to focus our education? Well, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, I, I never I never thought about it geographically um, because I do, I do think that I think it's getting I think the recognition is getting better worldwide, but I'm just not sure it's at the level that's deserved for our region. I mean, even customers that, you know, we talk to, you know, in Europe. Um, you know, they don't necessarily, you know, you say fashion, you think Paris, right? Milan, um, you yeah, think Washington, New York, you think, you know, Switzerland, <laughs> um, you know, you think cars, you think Italy or Germany. Yep. yep. But, but why, I mean, I, I honestly believe when you say robotics, you should think Pittsburgh. There's yeah. no reason. 
you don't think Massachusetts should at least be on the radar as well? Like, oh, I, absolutely. I agree oh, the absolutely. Bay Area has kind of been overshadowed. Um, you know, no, and, and I'm actually, sure I'll make um, some enemies for that. I'll get a lot of hate mail, assuming this gets the viewership I want. But <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what I've observed. I have eyes. And so. I don't, I don't, what, what, what did you say again? I said, I believe the Bay Area has been overshadowed by Pittsburgh and Massachusetts in terms of robotics output. Oh, no. Uh, pe people that I speak to agree with that. There are generally three main ecosystems in the world, right, that, that lead the robotics efforts, right? And, you know, this is by publications and, and, uh, you know, and other kinds of reports. Um, it's, it's Boston, Pittsburgh, and the Bay Area. And I, I think one of the primary reasons why Pittsburgh, or some of the primary reasons that Pittsburgh um, is considered ahead of the Bay Area um, there are several factors. Uh, one, I, I think first and foremost, is the, um, the breadth that we have and the volume that we have in the autonomous car uh, R&D side yeah. of things, right? I mean, there's certainly a, a large Usually amount Waymo. of that. Yeah. I'm sorry. So you see a lot of Waymo vehicles on the road when you're in the Bay Area these days, but you see Argo, Aurora, Uber, maybe not as much these days in Pittsburgh all the time. Emotional, right? Yeah, right. So, um, locomotion's uh, running their stuff. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Locomotion's starting to run their vehicles as well. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Right. I, I also think too that the Bay Area has um, a number of other uh, leading uh, industries. Of course. And so I mean, they're not going away as a giant. It's just they don't focus on robotics the way we do. Well, there's there's a, there's there's a lot of noise when it comes to that. So the concentration of companies and the density of companies in a small geographical area in Pittsburgh tends to stand out more, right? But you know those three regions are led by Stanford, CMU, and MIT. Yeah, it makes right? sense. And, and those those three organizations, you know, depending upon uh, how they were de their debate teams were to debate who's the best, <laughs> uh, one one is ahead, you know, of the other. Um, but, of course. Um, and but I have the CMU Kool-Aid in my veins. <laughs> what we have found is um, we've got uh, a large number of organizations here, and, and I'm still finding more. And so I can't tell you what that total number is, um, but I think it's on par with Boston. Now, I'll tell you where Boston's ahead right now, and this is the mission of the PRN. They're ahead on the commercial side of things. They have the commercial talent. They have the executive leadership in terms of total numbers. They have companies that are actually succeeding when it comes to market position and number of units deployed and, and revenue and investment and so on and so forth. Yeah. So that's really where we had a This is all congruent with my understanding. So I'm glad you brought that up. But you're right. In terms of research, I mean, I've also, you know, it's been my understanding and my observation directly from my dealings with NREC and Lincoln Labs and MIT and, you know, Carnegie Mellon, I mean, you know, in the Field Robotics Center where I personally worked, I mean, you know, it's CMU's doing amazing stuff, the best in the world. I mean, you mentioned Red Whitaker. Uh, Chuck Whitaker is a good friend of mine, uh, his brother. I don't know Red as well personally, but I mean, George Cantor has, you know, gone to bat for me on numerous occasions. He's also a great guy. And I mean, just the output is unquestionable. I mean, undeniable, I should say, you know, and I mean, yeah, you know, it's, it's, you know, in my opinion, the greatest robotics research institute in the world. I mean, you know, debatable with University of Tokyo, but I mean, I don't know. In terms of in the States, for sure. Agreed. Yeah. So how do we take that market share? How do we, how do we get that? Well, we do have it. Um, you know, in terms of recognition, um, it's some just good old commercial, you know, strategies uh, and tactics, right? Um, and so, you know, the, the Pittsburgh Robotics Network really exists. You know, we've got kind of three core pillars. Um, the first one is uh, promotion. So we will tell the story. This is why I appreciate the opportunity to do this. This is why we've been working on. with, you know, uh, Scott Solutions um, to, to hear about your stories. And uh, is it SKA or SKA? We prefer SKA, but we don't correct people. Okay, well, I corrected myself. So, uh, working with SKA Solutions, I got to know my members, Spencer. Oh, right? good. Happy to be a member, uh, and and proud to have yeah. done so for five years now. I mean, it's you know we're gonna right. keep contributing as much as we can, and you know it's it's the community that I love, and you know that we all love. 
So we, we're some old fashioned marketing and PR, right? And so uh, collaborating with companies, uh, getting the stories out, making some declarative, um, you know, taking some declarative positions and um, some, some of it being aspirational, uh, some of it being ambitious and following through on that. The other is, um, you know, good old fashioned, you know, trade organization activity, which is creating uh, connections. And um, we're, we're not, you know, we're not gonna be a standards body. Um, you know, we're not you. going to, Right, we're not going to do a lot of uh, you know technical, you know uh, um, you know partnerships and, and collaborations, so on and so forth. There's a lot of that that already yeah, exists. Yeah, and I have a lot of respect for my friends at ASME, and we've supported them financially in the past, and will continue to do so. But I don't think that's the role the PRN is is the best at, and I don't think that that you should pivot in that direction. I, you know, no, I, we're not. I'm not ashamed to say I'm. I'm you know, I. Love is probably a strong word, but I'm, I'm a massive fan of the PRN and, and, you know, I want to continue to contribute because, you know, I mean, the PRN has been good to us, you know, SK's entire existence, you know, the PRN has been there, you know, when we were a fledgling startup and we still are in many ways. I mean, you know, I mean, we were allowed to sit along with the big boys and, you know, kind of be in the same room and it opened a lot of opportunities and doors for us. And it was almost an equalizer in a way. I mean, the fact that, you know, if, if you're competent and you deliver value and you're respectful and you continue to show up and, and do good work, you know, and just bring it. I mean, that, you know, you'll get those opportunities and, and the PRN is almost like a venue for that. I mean, that's that's very powerful stuff. And I mean, it, well, it I go, I go back to that story of Nashville. I'm almost you know, up here. <laughs> Sorry. What's that? So I'm almost tearing up here. I'm getting kind of emotional wow. just talking about it, you know. Well, thank you, and hopefully we'll continue that. But, um, yeah. you know, there's no one clearinghouse for this community. And, you know, I go back to that Nashville story. I think there's a better way, um, you know, to um, to bring a group like, you know, a group, uh, you know, that had a worldwide presence uh, wanted to hear from us. We need to make it easier to have those business people come here. You know, everybody, if you're in, if you're in, uh, internet, software development, you know, social media platforms, blah, blah, blah. you end up in the Bay Area once a year, right? And uh, if you're in robotics, you need to be coming to Pittsburgh once a year. Yep. And we're an organization that um, can help get people around. Um, we are an accessible community. Sometimes there's a little bit of a hard shell, you know, outside of this community because we are heads down. That exists everywhere. <laughs> I mean, that, that exists in the yeah, Bay Area. Yeah, that's true. I, I took six trips to the Bay Area in 2019 trying to break into that community and get a foothold. We just got our first um, contract out of that sales mission this year, right? And I mean, it's it's always hard to crack into a new market. And I think Pittsburgh's just par for the course in terms of that. But I would also encourage outsiders to come here. I'm yeah. glad you brought it up. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're providing, we're building those connections. We're, we're playing off of our... Um, you know, our, our moniker is the uh, city of bridges and we're building bridges between Pittsburgh and the rest of the world. That's a beautiful way to look at it. And uh, this might be our shortest episode, but I feel like that's a wonderful note to end on. So. Oh, okay. I mean, we don't have to, but I feel like that's just such a cool, you know. No, that's tagline. good. And I, yeah. I, I appreciate it. There's uh, so much that's happening in Pittsburgh. And, um, you know, I, I encourage people uh, to come to our website, uh, robopgh.org. Uh, there's a way to sign up. We, we're actually going to be working on a new website. So, you know, I'll say, forgive me if you end up there. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it, um, uh, you know, as we've gone through this process, uh, you know, it's, you don't keep it up as much. And so we're, we're working on that and putting some of the new, um, some of the new programs that we're going to be working on, uh, you know, what we can do for our members, what we can do for people outside of Pittsburgh. And we can all, always be contacted at uh, info at uh, robopgh.org uh, or follow us on, you know, LinkedIn or Twitter uh, or the number of social media channels that, you know, exist today. Or, or have them call you, Spencer, and then uh, you'll put them in touch. Oh, for sure I will. But... I mean, the other thing, so ours is podcast.ska.solutions.no.com, but I always ask people at the end, is there anything you want to plug? And I love that you just jumped in. You're like, yeah, I got all these socials. Just take it. This is it. That's um, where I'm in sales. You're making it I easy mean, for me, so I appreciate it. 
Uh, you know, I'll tell you, we are, we're going to have a webinar series. Um, so I think that COVID actually created an audience for this and, and people can uh, watch it live or, or watch it sometime later. We'll have recorded content. Yeah. We're going to start in-person meetings again in September. Check out hopefully. episode one of that webinar series. <laughs> oh, well, it's Spencer, why don't you go ahead? So uh, best yeah, laid... sure. yeah, I can, I can talk about that. So it's best laid Please. plans. It's why, um... why haven't we brought that up yet? I don't know. Yeah, let's go into it. So it's it's based. I mean, this is going to be interesting because we're recording it. Well, this might date us, but we're recording it tomorrow from when this is recorded. This episode actually is going to air probably in about six weeks because of ah. our backlog of episodes that are currently going through editing. So we have nine recorded right let's now. Let's talk about how great the webinar went. Wasn't that a good time that we had? Oh, it was a blast. But I, I don't want to. I, mean, I, I don't want to speculate if we haven't done it yet, right? So it's. No, it was fantastic. Look, it was insightful. I mean, that, that interaction <laughs> between you and Jorgen was just priceless. Got a little heated, and, but I mean, you know, what can you say? Yeah. Right, right. So the, yes, that's right. There's some controversy that emerged from it. So you make sure you go find the recording yeah. and uh, check it out later. <laughs> Right? Yeah. <laughs> I thought about well, a few controversy jokes that I'm not going to actually say out loud, but... Uh, no, yeah. not with me. Not with me. Thank well, you. Well, and not on the air either, you know? I mean, that's the thing, right? It's 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 kind of fun, but you don't want to, you know, end your career for a joke. So... Well, uh, what, let's see. Let me... I uh, Desolate plans, product engineering and design strategies for field robotics. Yeah, so the idea is, is basically... Um, Getting people to talk about not only the the good parts and and I mean because everybody wants to talk about that I mean I also work in sales and it's a big part of my job and you know you it, the temptation is to say all the things that went right but what I'm learning the longer I'm alive and I'm sure this will continue you know well into senility you know it's, that um, things don't always go the way you expect and so everybody in robotics knows this right and the idea is. Um, you know, you, you plan for one thing, but you're trying to solve like a complicated problem that's never been solved before. And it's on the precipice of what can be done. And so um, inevitably something's going to go wrong. And, and if it doesn't, you're probably not trying hard enough. And so you know, it's like that Elon Musk quote on Rogan, you know, now uh, probably three months ago when this comes out. But, you know, um, you know, he says, if you're not blowing, you're supposed to blow up rockets, you know. And, and I mean, that's my old boss. I used to work at SpaceX. And so, I mean, yeah. you know, I definitely hold somewhat of a reverence for the guy still. And, um, you know, I, I agree with that sentiment very much. I mean, you know, in robotics, I, I've seen so many things go south and, and sideways and, you know, you name it. I mean, every single failure, I mean, and, and every time you see one of those, you know, I mean, I have a mentor that, that said to me, you know, earlier on in my career, and this is a lesson and a, and a sentiment I still very much internalize and hold true. I don't mind mind I don't mind making a mistake so long as I don't repeat it. And so I keep a journal of mistakes and lessons learned. And I don't oh. put entries in that often. Maybe I, I do like maybe every three weeks to like every six weeks I, I enter an entry. But when I have a particularly difficult day at work, you know, if I if I don't get to sleep for a week, if you know, something goes horribly wrong, if you know, we hire somebody to do a job and they screw it up you know, 70 different ways and we just have to make up for it with sheer brute force. I mean, there's so many different failure modes, but you know, my job as a con consulting contracting engineer slash program manager is to make sure the customer doesn't suffer because of that mistake. And so you're kind of a human shield. I mean, you know this, you've dealt with this, you've been that guy and you probably still are that guy in many ways. And so, I mean, you know, it's, I remember, you know, this is, this is one anecdote, but we were working on a project and uh, I'll say it was in the, um, the life sciences sector because that's safe and it uh, <laughs> doesn't give away too much. And um, we hired somebody for a decent amount of money to do a critical part of the system. And they um, told us things were going well and um, you know they appeared to be and they showed us MATLAB demos which showed everything we needed. and. Um, you know, it turns out when we got to, um, and I went to visit them, you know, in their state where they were at, and um, everything looked good, you know, and, and I had a great time, and we ate a bunch of meals together. Anyway, it was about a month to delivery, and, and this was a six-month project, um, which isn't a whole lot of time, but we tend to take on quick-term jobs. And so, um, turns out that uh, they had handed us the software equivalent of a box of springs and snakes. 
And, uh, you know, I, I mentioned earlier in the, in the pod that I have a degree in computer science, but I don't use it very often. I'm, I'm as I said, a hardware specialist, so I, I don't really enjoy programming. It's not, I don't think it's my calling, but, you know, I thought I wanted to early on. And so I, um, I had to put back on my programmer hat and go into the code myself. And we had seven engineers on the project. Um, and all of them, none of them wanted to tell me that this person that I trusted and held in such reverence had been screwing us over a barrel. But, um, you know, that's what it turned out to be. And finally, I looked at it and I saw all that stuff. And, you know, I, I mean, it was, it was horrible. I mean, it, you know, I didn't sleep for, you know, correctly, at least for about a month. I, I maybe got four hours of sleep for, for 30 days straight, you know, and yeah, because I was fixing their, their errors and I was going in and I had to, I had to be the new guy. And then I brought in, you know, three new coders on the project. And I felt like a World War One captain telling people to go into no man's land. You know, like it just, they get machine gunned down and you send another guy in, you know, like, oh, I know you next, you know, and, and obviously that wasn't literally what was happening, but I mean, it was a pretty terrifying, but also insightful moment. And I journaled when that happened and I, I wrote down, you know, sort of three lessons and one of them I won't repeat, but the other ones were don't repay anybody up front ever and define your scope very stringently for tasks that are flat rate. And so I, um, you know, I mean, that's, that's the kind of stuff I bullet in my, in my journal and, and why I, I kind of maintain that. I think it's going to be a good conversation tomorrow. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much. I get to sit, I get to sit back and listen. Yeah. I get to moderate. It should be fun too. I mean, you know, I, talking a lot now so i gotta i gotta take a break from that and uh no it should be exciting i'm, I'm looking Good. forward to it as well okay cool well hey follow pittsburgh robotics network uh joel mentioned the socials we may move that around in editing but again robopgh.org uh do you want to mention the others just real quick to to close it out well, just by email at info at robopgh.org uh, check it and out you can very easily on twitter linkedin or facebook beautiful Thanks for being on, Joel. We really appreciate it. I really appreciate it. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we'll do it again sometime if you want. This is this is a lot of fun. All right, let's talk in about a year or two when we are the very top robotics community in the world and we're known for it. Is that a promise? <laughs> it, it's an objective. Perfect. Hey, if you like what you just saw, please smash that like button, click subscribe. It's your support that will let us keep doing this. We can improve our production value, start releasing these more often. The more people like it, the more of these we're going to put out. So if you like it, subscribe, tell your friends. Thank you so much. You're the best.